Good morning and good afternoon and good evening to all of you. My name is Dr. Eileen Scholes and I am one of the mental health practitioners with the Hum Hum Space community. Welcome back. I am going to be talking today about communication and sex and consent. And today will be the first part of a two-part series where we talk about these particular subjects. Today we're focusing on self-awareness and communication. Um, I want to start off by just commending anyone who has, you know, experienced toxic communication or toxic relationships and you exercise the courage to just, you know, free yourself from that. That is incredible. I mean, the ability to leave a toxic situation, to recognize your worth and your value, and then embark on dating again, the dating adventure, you know, what bravery, what courage. And I really want to acknowledge that because as we talk about communication and sex, we're bringing our stories, right? We're bringing our experiences um, to the current dating adventure. And some people have experienced trauma. Some people have experienced a lot of toxicity in relationships. The beauty about um, Hum Hum Space and other conscious communities is that we are embarking on this journey of self-love and self-knowing, authenticity, being our best selves, which of course improves our prospects for dating. So again, I acknowledge all of you who have moved through toxic relationships. Bravo, well done. Those of you that are putting your lives back together, empowering yourselves, encouraging yourselves, believing in yourselves, you're awesome. I mean, really, it's amazing to believe that you deserve more and that you're worth it. And um, I'm just really excited that you are choosing to be brave and you know explore dating again through a new lens of who you are now, not, not what you went through, but who you are now. So bravo. Again, we're talking about communication, sex, dating, consent, and hello, those of you that have waved to me, thank you for joining. Um, so sex and communication are things that come up quite often, you know, in clinical work. Um, there's a lot of confusion about um, sex. The, people don't always communicate in the best ways. There's so many variables that contribute to the way people perceive sex and sexual communication and what's consented, consensual, what's not. So we're going to talk today about um, several things. Number one, ways that we communicate. Number two, styles of communication. Number three, love languages. Uh, number four, interpretation and integration of what's been communicated. And then number uh, five, self-knowing as a type of communication. And then I'll answer a couple of the questions that have come forward. We've been compiling all your questions and the ones that seem to come up the most, those are the ones we're focusing on at this time. So ways that we communicate. And I'll, a lot of this is going to sound very basic, but I wanna break it down so that we can integrate all of this together and really improve our communication style with others so that we are all on the same page when it comes to sex and consent and communicating about intimacy, okay? So there's verbal communication. That is your content. That's what's coming out of your mouth. It's what you're actually talking about. It also includes tone of voice, which is how soft or loud or pressured, nervousness, and then there's intonation which is the rise and fall of the voice when you're speaking. All of this is important, especially if you're dealing with someone who is, um, Trump has been traumatized, or if the communication, let's say you were having an argument, you wanna pay attention to your tone of voice and the rise and fall of your voice, okay? Then there's nonverbal communication. This is process versus content. So content's what you're talking about, and process is everything else. Where the person sits when they are at dinner. Um, do they stand until you're also seated? Do they start eating their meal before 
your meal has even been served. Um, you know, do you do what's their energy like when you are on the date? Are they self consumed, self absorbed, or are they, you know, do they seem like they're engaged? Do they shake hands upon meeting you? Things like hugs, kissing, a hand on the shoulder or on the leg or around the waist. These things are all the nonverbal ways that we communicate. And then there's body language. So this is your physical disposition. It includes eye language, glares and stares and seductive eyes and batting the eyes, right? Or narrowing the eyes. All of that is part of body language. Also hand gestures. Some people talk with their hands. They, you know, there, there's a lot of hand action going on when they're communicating. For some of us, maybe we need to tone that down. <laughs> and you know, maybe not. Maybe it's just a part of your energy signature and your personality. Also, the nervous system responds, um, you know, as part of your body language. And so you can have somatic symptoms. Somatic symptoms would be the physical experiences such as sweaty palms or uh, heart beating really fast, um, butterflies in the stomach or maybe headache or muscle tension, anything, you know, physical, but it's actually an emotional response. So it's a physical response to an emotional experience you're having. And that's part of the body language as well. And then there's pheromones. Pheromones are those invisible hormones that we produce when we are around people and they certainly can increase attractability. Research shows us that certain body scents are directly connected to human attraction. And the ability to smell pheromones helps us at a subconscious level recognize um, potential compatible partners. So research also shows us that as we're smelling someone, <laughs> assuming you're attracted to the pheromones that they are emitting the research says that if you stand next to them long enough you could actually begin to feel like you're intoxicated then there's attentive communication versus non interested or distracted so if you know if you're on a date and someone's on their phone the whole time um, or you know they're not paying attention to you when you're talking obviously they're either not interested, they might be nervous, um, but they might be distracted or not interested or they just really don't have great communication skills. And you, you all will have to decide as you're navigating your, your journey, what's tolerable and what's not. There are times when we feel so disrespected, it's just not tolerable. But then there's times when you recognize that the person you're dealing with is a good person, an interesting person, but maybe they just don't have the greatest communication skills. Maybe they haven't practiced a lot and maybe they're worth it to you enough for you to hang in there so that they can you know, develop that muscle, that communication muscle. So then there's posture, all right? So there's erect posture and then there's slouching. This is an interesting one, posture, because it communicates to the other party how you feel about them, how you feel about yourself, and how you feel about the date or the experience. You know, an erect, engaged posture is suggesting that you're attentive and you're interested and you're enjoying the experience. Slouched is like, wah, 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 I don't want to be here. Oh my gosh. It either suggests that you don't feel worthy enough to be there, you're not deserving of this date with this other person, or you're just bored out of your mind, you're not interested, you're not, you, you would have had more fun staying at home, eating popcorn, watching, you know, The Simpsons. I don't know. <laughs> you know, so posture, pay attention to your posture as it is communicating a lot about how you feel about the experience and how you feel about yourself. And then there's written language. And we are, we are living in, you know, a day and age where people send emails and texts direct messages on social media. I mean, that is what we all do now, right? There's also love notes, love letters, traditional, you know, ways of communicating your feelings. Pay attention to the fact, don't forget, that when we send our emails and our text messages and our direct messages, oftentimes the context 
in which we are communicating and the tone that can be completely lost, right? Because they don't hear us. So when it comes to communicating about intimacy, sex, and love, whenever possible, consider voice to voice as less is lost in translation that way. And of course, if you can communicate in person, all the better. Now, listening. Listening is a part of communication. So we're still talking about ways that we communicate. Listening includes presence and attentiveness and reflecting back to the other party what you've heard them say or what you learned. Now, if you blurt out a response before the other person has completed what they're saying, that is communicating that you're not as interested in what they have to say. If you are coming up with a response in your head, an answer before they've completed what they are saying, you don't necessarily know you've got the full context and you're communicating that what you're thinking about is more important than what they're saying at that moment. If you're conceptualizing the information that you've, you're hearing as a problem that needs to be fixed, this certainly can impair communication. So for example, if you know, you're know you on a date with someone and you say, how's your dating adventure going? And they say, oh, you know, the last three dates have really been hard. Um, you know, I, I really thought that they were gonna be good, but these three things all happened in all three dates and I don't know what's going on. And you conceptualize it as, well, you're the problem. And you begin to respond to them or, you know, give them feedback on how they can fix that problem. You might um, derail your communication with that person because they may not have perceived that they were the problem. They may have just perceived that they went on three bad dates. So pay attention to your listening skills. When you're on a date, it's a wonderful way to hone your ability to listen. And, and you're gonna learn so much information. It's data collection. If you're talking, if you're blabbing the entire time, you might miss very important information that would give you clues and cues as to whether this is someone you want to continue dating and um, enjoying the adventure with, or are there red flags? So definitely hone those listening skills as part of the communication. Then there's responding versus reacting. Responding is thoughtful, it's meaningful, it's very engaged, okay? And it considers what would be the most appropriate thing to say, which sometimes it's nothing, <laughs> to be honest. Sometimes that's the most appropriate style of communication, nothing. The response doesn't have to be verbal. It can be a hug, it can be silence, it can be engagement, it can be your energy. But then reacting is more impulsive. It's not as thoughtful. It can be erratic and it can create unnecessary problems if you react versus respond. Because sometimes if in the silence, like let's say you're having a, a tense moment with someone, but you both just calm and you breathe together. Let's just breathe for a moment. And from that place you respond versus react with something aggressive, you can really bring a situation down and maybe salvage that relationship. And if it's not to be salvaged, maybe you can salvage the date at least <laughs> so that nobody leaves upset. Then there's oversharing. Hmm. Oversharing is in clinical terms, we call it spilling. It's where you, sh you share too much too soon or share things that weren't necessary or maybe um, you devalue yourself and so you say a lot of things like, you know, that no, nobody needs to know that you've got that wart, you know, behind your, your left ankle, like not on the first day, you know, <laughs> maybe keep some stuff to yourself. Um, I'm using humor, you know, because obviously sometimes people have trauma that they know they're going to have to bring up at some point with a significant other and navigating when to do that can be very difficult. but. Consider the things that don't need to be said um, or don't need to be said in great detail, okay? Um, lack of containment, lack of privacy, lack of a little bit of mystery can derail your communication. So consider, you know, sharing, but always leaving a little bit, not, not lying, not misleading, no mind games, 
but consider that there's levels to this communication thing and there's levels to this dating experience and we don't necessarily need to share a whole life story that same day or that first date or even the first couple of dates. Maybe it's an expanded beautiful journey with twists and turns. Think of your dating adventure as a book with different chapters and each chapter may be very different with different adventures. So let it unfold naturally and organically and, and in ways that um, protect you, protect your vulnerability, right? Protect the sanctity of this new relationship that you're experiencing. Protect the other person because you don't know yet whether they can handle all your truth. You don't know yet whether they can handle all your trauma. And it can be more triggering for you or re-traumatizing if you overspill, overshare very early in the relationship only to find out they didn't want to know what you had to say. I saw something recently on social media that said, the most painful experience is to share your pain with somebody who chose to hurt you any, like still chose to hurt you, you know, that kind of thing. So these are things we're not going to know until we get to know somebody a little bit better. Okay, body scanning is another um, form of communication. So this is self-monitoring, physical self-monitoring, checking in with your body reactions, your heartbeat, your breathing, is it normal, is it tense, you know, is it labored or stressful, um, are your ears ringing, are your eyes twitching, is your lip, you know, twitching, what, do you, what are you doing, <laughs> what's happening to you physically while you're on this date and you're with this other person. So this is communication within your own being, it's body to brain and brain to body. Okay, there's an exchange going on under the surface. The other person that you're with may not even know this is happening, but you are noticing. And if you're dialed in to your own energy and you're paying attention, it's going to help you. So take heed to what your body is saying and what your body is, what your body is saying by showing you how it's feeling. This is going to help you navigate from a place of truth in terms of do I continue to date this person or is something, is my nervous system letting me know, I don't think so, I don't want to do this. Recognize that communication can be cold, it can be distracted, it can be rigid, sarcastic, cynical, um, self-devaluing, it can be very self-important, I'm all that, entitled, right? So it can be humble. There are many, many different ways we, we um, communicate and when we are nervous or distressed, if, if we're not comfortable in our own skin and we haven't done our own work to really be authentic, sometimes we have a tendency to communicate in ways that aren't even the way we want. Like we come off cold or we come off sarcastic or we come off um, as entitled. And, and really maybe you're just kind of shy and nervous, but because you're not showing up as your most authentic self, it's your style of communication is communicating something that you don't want. So of course, our launching pad for communication is authenticity and truth, healing, being our best self, being our most authentic and most organic self, moment to moment in all situations. So we just went through ways we communicate. Now I'm going to talk about styles of communication. So there's assertive, aggressive, passive, and passive aggressive. Assertive communication is straightforward. It includes self-dignity, respect for self, and others. It's authentic, organic, and there's no ego, and there's no competition. It is the way to communicate for healthy relationships and a sense of um, peace in terms of how we have communicated with others. My light just went off. I guess it's going to do that. I'll fix it if it does. Um, then there's aggressive. Aggressive is sharp, edgy, confrontational, very egocentric, ego encapsulated, must win, must dominate, offended if someone else has an opinion differing from yours and if they have a different way of doing things than you would do. Um, this a person, this communication style looks for a fight. What's interesting is that deep down inside, this person has a lot of insecurity and they actually don't want to share power with you because at some point in their experience, they have felt powerless. And so it's about control and it's because if they're not in control, 
of situations and if they're not controlling you and if they're not dominating, they feel less than, okay? So they have something to prove and for them being assertive doesn't seem like a rational option ever. And then there's passive. So our passive communication style is shy, unsure, it defers to others, it's object referent instead of self referent. It avoids conflict at all costs. Um, there's no interest in rocking the boat. There's, uh, this person goes with the flow, you know, and passes on opportunities to shine or to show their value. They'd rather just kind of stay in the shadows, lurking back. Um, sometimes this is because of uh, trauma. Um, sometimes it's because of the family of origin that they grew up in. Sometimes it's from being in a series of toxic relationships where their power was lost. Um, many, many variables contribute to the passive communication style, but this person has completely given their power away or never activated healthy personal power in the first place. Then there's passive aggressive. <laughs> Ooh, this person inwardly is so angry, but they have repressed the anger for so long. And guess what? They're not going to take it anymore. <laughs> but they're not telling you that. <laughs> Inside, they're not going to take it anymore, but they're not going to tell you that. They're just going to show you in various ways, such as eye rolls, sighing, <sighs> slamming cabinet doors and slamming doors and um, cynical responses and you know condescending language oh yeah i know people like you do that all the time oh yeah i thought you said that you were going to wash the dishes but there they are piled in the sink again i guess a woman's work is never done you know that kind of thing very passive aggressive it is um anger that has been repressed for so long and this person is about to blow and yet they're not going to tell you <laughs> they're not going to just directly say you know i'm really upset that i work all day and i come home and there's dishes piled up in the sink from food i didn't even make i'd really appreciate you know equanimity i'd really appreciate it if we can all get on the same page can we all clean the house can we all take turns washing the clothes and cleaning the bathroom and things like that right <laughs> so um, and let, let's see, thank you, William, for your comment. Response, latency, and time are big nonverbal written indicators. Yes, thank you so much for that. So the passive aggressive person is very judgmental of others, but deep down inside, like I said, very angry with their self, believe it or not, for not knowing how to set better boundaries and to be assertive. They secretly wish they could be assertive. They wish they'd set better boundaries. They wish they didn't feel so taken advantage of, but they're really not sure how to navigate that. Again, family of origin probably pay, plays a big part. So number three, love languages. And according to Gary Chapman, there are five of them. Words of affirmation, quality time, acts of service, physical touch, and receiving gifts. I'm not going to say these are the only love languages, but you know, Gary Chapman's love languages are quite popular and a lot of therapists reference them. So words of affirmation are um, those beautiful statements that a person might say, such as, I love you. I love the way that you, you know, um, write. I love the work that you do. I love the way that you decorate. Oh, your garden is so beautiful so much work and effort, words of affirmation, quality time. You know, people, there are people who just love to just be with you. You don't even have to say anything. There are people who would love to be with you in silence. They just love your energy. They want to enjoy your company. And then acts of service would be things like cooking dinner, doing the laundry, washing the car, making those phone calls or paying the bill so that the other person um, doesn't have to do it. It's those little things, thinking ahead, what will make your person's uh, life a little bit easier with an act of service. Physical touch, you know. Now this one's interesting because of course many times when people love physical touch they love a lot of sexual intimacy as well, but not always. So think about communicating. Let's say that two of you, the two of you um, both say that physical touch is your love language 
for one, that means a lot of sex all the time, twice a day. And then for the other person, it's non-sexual touching and cuddling, hand holding, that kind of thing. So again, we have to talk about this stuff, right? So that we're all on the same page. And then the last one, receiving gifts. Sometimes when I work with people, they're a little nervous about that one because they think that this it's going to be expensive. My person's going to be expensive, high maintenance. They Their love language is receiving gifts, and I don't know if I can afford that all the time. And while there may be some people that only want the diamonds and the rubies and the gold, most for most people that enjoy receiving gifts, it could be a flower that you picked from your garden or some fruit, a basket of fruit that you got from your trees. You know, it can be a poem that you wrote that you put to paint or you put on some nice paper. It doesn't have to be expensive. Um, I think with receiving gifts, a lot of the time, creativity and thoughtfulness, it's the intention that goes a, a long way. And if you happen to find that you're with someone who is very materialistic and, um, you know, and that doesn't work for you, then that might not be your person. And so communicating clearly to yourself first and then to the other that that's not going, that's not for you, okay? So people often assume that their love language is also their partner's love language, and that's not necessarily true. So if my love language is words of affirmation, and I really enjoy that, and I assume that that's what my partner wants, I might be missing the boat. So communicating, um, early on about the love languages is going to be very helpful, I think. And you can use that as one of your, your dates. You know, if the person, your person isn't familiar with the five love languages or you're not, you can do some research together. You could read the book together. I believe the book is online and available for free on YouTube. Um, there's quizzes and tests you can take on the five love languages and they don't only apply to romantic partnerships. They also apply to your relationship with your children and your family members and even work different, uh, different settings. So we've talked about ways we communicate, styles of communication, love languages. Now interpretation and integration. So these are the ways we make sense of what we're hearing and we're learning from the other person. Our video paused for a moment, so hopefully we're back. Um, interpretation can come from really listening and a grounded sense of self. It can also uh, be the byproduct of asking a lot of questions for clarification. Um, if you view the experience as holding space for the other without judgment, you're more than likely going to interpret what's being communicated to you in the correct way. At the very least, you can ask questions for clarification so that the two of you can be on the same page. But then there's also misinterpretation, right? And when there's misinterpretation, there's defensiveness. Um, people are offended or confused. People can feel judged or sideswiped or even overwhelmed. There's also attachment styles, and we talked about this several weeks ago. Secure attachment, anxious attachment, and avoidant attachment these stem from childhood experiences, and if you're not familiar with them, I do encourage you to look them up because they absolutely impact the way that we communicate with others and the way we interpret what others are communicating to us. Individuation versus group think. Individuation is when you are self-referent, you go within to interpret what the other person is saying, you ask ask yourself questions, you connect the dots, you put the puzzle pieces together to figure out what this person is saying. And if you need clarification, you go directly to the source. Whereas groupthink is when we go to a collective or we go to a council or we go to our friends or we go to our family to interpret what our person is actually saying or doing. Well, what does this mean? Well, he said this, well, she said this, well, they did this. I don't know what that means. And you go to the group, which that can be helpful if your group is very wise and knows your person. It can also backfire because the group consensus may be completely off. So consider individuating, trusting your, your own gut, and if you need clarification, going directly to the source. But on that note, if your person is offended that you don't know that you're coming for a clarification, you're just saying, hey, when you said, X, Y, and Z, did you mean this? And they get offended by the fact that you're clarifying. 
then that person probably needs some healing. <laughs> they probably need to go back to the drawing board and, and work on what's going on with them that they're so offended that somebody actually wants to know them better. And that's not your fault. That's not on you. So, you know, just do your best. And remember, we're all this whole experience is data collection. <laughs> We are navigating, right? We are learning, we're integrating, we're interpreting, we're connecting dots, we're putting puzzle pieces together, and we're it's all helping us to recognize whether this person is our person and how we want to show up in the dating experience. It's all a win-win if we look at it from the perspective of its data that is helping us be our best self and really get clarification about what works and what doesn't work. So then there's integration, and this occurs based on how you've interpreted the information that was shared. So there's also subconscious processes involved in integrating and, and of course in our communication. If you notice that you become dysregulated at any point when you're on a date or communicating with someone, you get upset, you get flustered, you feel overwhelmed, overloaded, um, stressed out, anxious, depressed, you know, very, very triggered, chances are you're moving into fight or flight. And if you're moving into fight or flight, then you're releasing a lot of cortisol in the body um, and you are clearly in, in stress. And so one of the things that, that's going to be important if you're a person who's easily triggered or you've had trauma, you know, because anything can be that is said or communicated can um, re-traumatize you or re-trigger you depending on what you've been through, right? Um, this this process alone can disrupt the communication so you want to learn distress tolerance techniques deep breathing positive affirmations you can say in the moment brain reset i give myself full permission to calm down i'm letting fear go i'm letting worry go i'm de-stressing now you know anything any little thing that you can say that will calm you and you do it with breath right to distress to create some distress from to create sorry de-stress from the um whatever's being communicated whatever triggered you and recognize it may be conscious and it may be subconscious but if you notice that you're integrating from a place of trauma or from being triggered step back do your deep breathing see if you can finish if you're on a date see if you can finish the date um grounded and if you're not able to do that then you know give yourself permission to take care of yourself and honor you and you're doing the other person a favor as well and you may avoid communicating in a way that is very sharp or aggressive or um, from you know a trauma response because you're taking care of yourself so continue to honor yourself so then number five there's self-knowing as communication and this is where this is communication that stems from the self it's self-realization self-acknowledgement self-value and self-trust. It's a communication happening from within. It's an inward process that creates balance in your life. And it's the direct result of feeling whole and it creates a healthy perspective. So if you have successfully removed the unhealthy ego, because not all ego is bad, ego can be the thing that causes us to have drive and ambition and you know, get things done and accomplish goals. But if you have successfully removed the unhealthy ego, um, then there's a beautiful self-knowing that begins to emerge from you. And this becomes your greatest treasure because the self-knowing becomes the guiding force of your life. And you begin to make decisions and communicate from this beautiful self-knowing. You are whole, okay, in this space. And this begins to create internal peace because as you are this whole person, you've done your work, right? And you feel whole, you feel authentic, you feel grounded. This completely radically changes your dating experience and your communication style. Why? Because in your whole grounded, authentic space, you only want to attract and date whole, grounded, authentic humans. So look at how self-communication is so important because when you are 
in touch with who you are and all that you have learned and all the work you've done to to bring you to this point you know you are healthy and you're making better choices now and you know yourself now you love yourself now and you're navigating from there communicating from that space it's going to become very clear who is able to match your energy within with that regard and if they're not no judgment but you know you probably if the more work you've done on yourself the more you probably will want to communicate with people who um, have a similar communication style as you okay so that being said communication sex consent this was part one now we're going to get into a couple of questions that have come forth from our hum hum participants and some of our groups and experiences um, this first question it's sort of three parts what is the best way to bring up sex with someone you are dating what are healthy parameters and how do i recognize them what other considerations are there so I'm gonna answer that with some questions. What are you willing to experience? Make sure you're very clear about what's comfortable for you. Some people you know, love making out, they love kissing. Some people are not into that. You know, We've already talked about physical touch. It's interesting how there are people who enjoy sex but don't want a lot of cuddling and snuggling before or after. So these are things that are really important for you to know. First of all, what are you willing to experience? What feels aligned? How do you feel when you're around the person versus how you felt when you were talking to them on the phone or chatting with them? What has anything changed? Have you noticed that your attraction has increased or decreased? Are you more comfortable with them, less comfortable, or is it the same? Do you notice that when you're around the person it's very different from the way you imagined or even fantasized things would be with them? And what do you need in this moment? Very, very important. What do you need in this moment? Notice your body's communication as you ponder all of these things. How's your nervous system? How's your breathing when you're, you know, experiencing this person thinking about talking, you're talking about sex, you're thinking about sex, um, you're considering having the conversation with the person. Check in, breathe, stay present, okay? Before, during, after, check in, breathe, stay present. Before intimacy, during the intimacy, are you breathing? <laughs> and then afterwards, check in, breathe, stay present. If you find that you're dissociating, be kind to yourself. If possible, ground yourself before becoming intimate so you know that you're fully present and fully consenting. Be honest and navigate the experience based on what serves your highest good and the highest good of the other party, okay? I can't tell you what that is. You're, this is where your self-knowing is going to come in, your hard work, all your work on yourself, loving yourself, your self-realization, being true and authentic. This is where this is going to come in, okay? And honoring your body and paying attention to your nervous system. This is what's going to help you navigate. But if you're checking out, dissociating when it comes to intimacy, um, do yourself a favor, ground before becoming intimate so that you know truly you're truly present and willing to engage in intimacy with another. So recognizing the ideas that you have about sex and intimacy are very, very important. Where do these ideas come from? Are they genuinely your ideas? Are they the, the thought process of your family, your community, your culture, your religion? Are these ideas helpful at this time? And with whatever you think about sex and intimacy, are you being kind to yourself in this moment? Or are you being judgmental? Are you judging your body? Are you thinking that you know, you're know you only as good as you can perform? Are you being kind? Are you being loving? Or are you being mean? Are you being judgmental? And if you're being mean and you're being judgmental, where's that coming from? Is that that toxic relationship you were in before where you felt so devalued and you felt like you were an object? Where's that coming from? Check in, be honest with yourself. What expectations do you have about yourself in this moment? Are you being fair? Again, are you being kind? Are you placing expectations that are too high on yourself? And how do you own your expectations about yourself? And how do your expectations about yourself affect 
the experience that you're having or about to have? These are questions you have to ask and you've got to be willing to be authentic as you answer them. And they should happen before sex, right? You want to know all of these things before you go into sexual intimacy. Are you able to experience without expectation? Can you go into this without having expectation and be okay with whatever unfolds because it's an adventure? Are you going to allow yourself that? Or do you go in with very rigid ideas about who you are, who they are, and how it has to be? All this is communication, and it doesn't impact your sexual intimacy. For some of you, it may be helpful to recognize this experience as a sacred moment, okay? Depending on your spiritual practices, meditative practices. If you view it as a sacred moment, it might be helpful. For others, you might want to see it as body healing, mind body, you know, energy healing, the connection. If you conceptualize it that way, for some of you, that's going to really be helpful. For others of you, maybe conceptualizing it as a playful exchange, you know, part of the adventure, we're, we're playing and the bedroom is our playground. <laughs> that might work for some of you. However you conceptualize sexual intimacy, um, Remember, please be kind, be gentle, be loving, be patient with yourself and with the other. And I really want to encourage truth statements. So truth statements, when we're approaching sexual intimacy with someone, um, you might say something like, I'm enjoying our time together. What is your comfort level with physical intimacy? Or, I'm really enjoying our time together. Are you also enjoying our time, to, your, our time together? Because if they say no, then you might, <laughs> you might want to table the sex talk for now, right? But if they're also on the same page, you're navigating. But truth statements start with I. I'm enjoying our time together. I'm enjoying the company that we, we keep when we're together. I, I love the things we do. I'm having so much fun. I'm enjoying getting to know you. You know, what is your comfort level around sexual intimacy? Are you and the other party comfortable having a good time together in the first place? Or is it, do you notice that the first few dates have been kind of stiff and rigid and it's difficult to communicate and it's difficult to connect? Um, jumping into sex may not be the best thing for you. Although other people become a lot more comfortable after they've been intimate. So again, you've got to be true to yourself and navigate accordingly. Are you ready for intimacy with this person emotionally, physically, and energetically? You really want to know that first. And if possible, you know, if you're able to have that conversation with the other um, so that you know that you're both on the same page, that would be great. Definitely wait for informed consent. So what is informed consent? You're expressing the parameters, both of you, your preferences, the degree of interest, and your philosophy about sex. You both feel comfortable about what the other person feels about that. What are your expectations about monogamy versus poly, right? Is it a, just a stress release for you? Is it a, a deep energy exchange? You know, is it just something we do to pass time? Or you know, is this a deep, meaningful soul mystery that two people come together and, you know, they traverse the universes through sexual intimacy and orgasmic bliss? Like, you really want to know your partner's philosophy and view on all of these things because it definitely will help you navigate. It will help you ask the right questions and it will help you not feel used or taken advantage of or, you know, misunderstood or any of that type of stuff. Be careful not to send mixed messages. Be as clear as possible while standing in your truth. Another question that came forth, what are some of the best ways to normalize sexual interest without coming off like an insensitive person who is only interested in one thing? Well, again, focus on the enjoyment that you're having Obviously, this isn't, I'm not teaching you guys how to have sex, right? <laughs> I'm talking about the communication part of it. You know, a person that feels seen, witnessed, heard, known, that person, 
usually is going to be less defensive with you and less guarded with you and be more open to you. So if you focus on the enjoyment of that person and the experience that you have with them as something that lights you up, that you're really enjoying this adventure and they can feel that excitement, that enjoyment that you are experiencing as the result of spending time with them, that's probably, that's really great communication. They're gonna feel really good. And even if they're not ready to be physically intimate right then and there, chances are that they're gonna get there as long as the two of you continue to vibe and have this beautiful, authentic, open you know, communication exchange. So a truth statement. I'm enjoying our time together. Are you enjoying our time together? Are you comfortable making love at this point? Now, I understand to some of you, it may not be making love. You know, you have your different vernacular, but reconsider with all of the different people on the planet that have experienced trauma, um, the chances of you dating someone that is triggered at some point when it comes to sex, sexual intimacy, sexual conversations, you know, it's, it's relatively high, not to be Debbie Downer, but it's relatively high to imagine that at some point you will interact with someone who's experienced sexual trauma, right? So when you say things like, oh, I want you. Now, there's levels. Remember I told you there's levels. So there's going to come a point in your dynamic where, yeah, I want you. I want to I wanna make love to you and a whole bunch of other stuff you could say, which I'm not going to say. <laughs> but you know what I mean? There's levels. So you can get there at some point. But when you're first initiating um, sexual communication, just consider you might be dealing with someone who hasn't shared the fact that they've been traumatized or sexualized or something in the past. And so if you say, I want you, or I want to make love to you, even though that sounds non-threatening to you, it may be very threatening to them. So when you say, what is your comfort level um, with making love at this time? You're not saying, I want you. You know, it doesn't feel like you are trying to pressure them, but you are putting out there that you, you do have interest. And you're also letting them know that you're very interested in their comfort level, and you're willing to back off and wait if they're not comfortable. So this was part one of communication and sex and consent. We focused on self-awareness and communication. A few tips that I'd love for all of us to just consider, stay present, be intentional. Yes, even with sex, even with sexual communication, be intentional, be clear about what your intentions are and communicate as clearly as we can. Let's use affirmations and breath to remain calm and grounded because a lot of us get really nervous. Some people get a little too cocky <laughs> and everything in between. Um, so use breath, stay grounded, and give your body the command code. So I'll, I'll end pretty much with this. What are command codes? Affirmations, brain reset protocols. If you're a person who tends to get nervous or you've been in toxic relationships before, or it's been a long time, maybe you've been celibate for a while, or you just haven't experienced the sexual intimacy that you're ready to, to experience now, you can say things like, I give myself full permission to enjoy intimacy with another person. And you breathe. I am allowing myself to feel worthy. I'm allowing my body to be enough. I honor my body and I love my body just the way that I am. I'm giving myself permission to share my body with another person. I am excited and interested in experiencing sexual energy exchange with another. So these types of whatever statements you wanna make, brain reset protocols, you can create them yourself. You're uploading new software to your brain so you can reconceptualize the sexual experience and conversations around sex. Use your words and your language and your authentic truth to upload the information that you want your brain to focus on and then the brain will disseminate that information to the body system, including the nervous system, okay? So, and of course this will impact the pheromones um, that people pick up when they're around you. So. Oh, it's a lot, right? But it is an adventure. It is a very beautiful journey to be on, getting to know self um, and then sharing self with another person. 
It's mind, body, energy, spirit, and it can be a lot of fun. Just give yourself permission to enjoy every aspect of it. Continue to show up as your most authentic self and communicate from that, you know, that high launching pad. And you're going to have some really beautiful adventures, some very beautiful experiences. Like I said last week or two weeks ago, don't forget to bring passion into the experience. Do those things that light you up. Think about those things that light you up. Bring that positive energy into your dating adventures. So tomorrow, um, Alexandra, the founder of Hum Hum and I, will be co-facilitating our Conscious Date group. It meets at 10 a.m. Uh, Pacific Daylight Time and 1 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. We love to see you there. Feel free to sign up on the website if you haven't already. And Alexandra also does an additional offering 20 minutes before our group. She offers a beautiful meditative yoga breathing experience for those that would like to participate. You can certainly add that on if you sign up. Be well, everyone. I hope you have a really wonderful week and um, weekend and see you again. Bye.